<clears throat> Hi, welcome back. We're going to talk about adverse events today. You already talk about adverse events, you don't even realize it. So adverse events are just sort of a nice technical name for side effects, right? Everybody talks about side effects. When you watch um, commercials aimed at medical consumers, you'll see, right, uh, talk to your doctor if you experience any of the following. Um, heartburn, constipation, those kinds of things. So how do they end up being in those commercials? Where do the adverse events come from and how do they get eventually reported to the FDA? So we're going to talk about that today. So first thing we need to do is talk about some applicable regulations. I just want to make you aware that these are um, based on regulations. You don't have to go and look at these regulations. I just want to make you aware that there is a reason why we do this. The, for the primary one is Health and Human Service Regulations 45 CFR Part 46. That's all you need to know. Most, though, of what you're going to deal with as a research coordinator is secondary regulations. 21 CFR 312. 312 deals with new drugs. Um, biologic drugs, immunotherapy, <clears throat> anything that's a drug is in 312. By and large, all the clinical research coordinator classes are going to discuss 312, whereas A12 is exclusively medical devices. There's an over, uh, there's an auto, excuse me, an awful lot of overlap between 312 and A12, but we're really going to live in 312. And once you get into the good clinical practice class, uh, we will start diving in a little bit and finding more detail in there. I just want to make you aware that this is all based on regulations. So the first question we should ask is, what is an adverse event? This is easy. It's an untoward or unfavorable a medical occurrence in a human subject, including any abnormal sign, symptom, or disease. This is basically anything bad that happens. <clears throat> and this is only for, it doesn't involve preclinical research. It's just clinical research because it just, we're talking about humans. So. If you're on an acne trial and the acne gets better, that's not an adverse event because it's a good thing. This is something bad that happens, untoward or unfavorable. And it's temporally associated with the subject's participation in the research. So it's something bad that happens while the subject is on a clinical trial, regardless whether or not considered related to the subject's participation in the research. So. We'll talk about causality later, but this is anything bad that happens to someone while they're on a trial. And this is a very modified definition from ICH guidelines. And again, we'll get into those in a lot of detail in good clinical practice. But anyway, it's something bad and it happens while they're on a trial. So when does a medical finding become an adverse event? Because not every medical finding is an adverse event. So when it is not an adverse event, a medical finding is definitely not an adverse event when it was present at baseline. And when I say baseline, I mean the time that person started on the clinical trial. So when that person comes in for the very first history and physical and they tell you they have asthma, and right, they're not on the trial yet, they have not been dosed with anything yet, that is not an adverse event. It's present at baseline, so I can't, it's pre-existing in that case. So I came onto the trial with my asthma, and as long as it doesn't get any worse, it's not going to be an adverse event. So when that person says, I've had asthma my whole life, I'm going to ask a lot of questions about the severity of the asthma, and then I'm going to document all of those things. The baseline findings have to be really clearly documented if you want to make an argument that it was not an adverse event. And I think of documentation this way. Don't think of it as being time consuming or a pain in the neck. Um, when you document your baseline findings, whether it's you or your investigator, you're doing yourself a service because I always live in this fantasy world where I'm going to win the lottery and then I'm going to buy myself a little island in Bali and I'm going to go live in a hut over the ocean forever, right? And that my notes that I leave behind will be useful to the people who did not buy lottery tickets. Now, a medical finding will become an adverse event when a few things happen. The first one is if it's new, right? So anything that happens, we've already established it's, un it's an unfavorable medical event that happened while that person was on trial. So if it's new, we're going to say it's an adverse event. Or 
if that asthma that was present at baseline suddenly gets a lot worse, right? So it suddenly is a change in the asthma. We're not going to consider an, an adverse event unless it changes. And if it gets worse, then it's an adverse event. So we're going to ask ourselves lots of questions, and we're going to do some examples of this, so don't get all tied up in a knot about it. We're going to work through a couple examples. Causes of adverse events can include pre-existing conditions. Right, so hypertension, uh, very common, people with diabetes, asthma, these pre-existing conditions can suddenly get worse. And again, it doesn't say whether or not it's related to that person's participation in clinical research. We just, just this pre-existing condition that got worse. So the more pre-existing conditions a person has, the more likely that they might have an adverse event. Concomitant medications. You're always going to ask, and we're not going to get into a lot of detail about this here, but you're always going to ask your research participants what medications they take. Um, and so sometimes this can cause an adverse event. So uh, anticoagulants is another word for blood thinners, right? So you could have an adverse event there, steroids. Any over-the-counter medication can cause an adverse event. So um, it is worth asking your participants very detailed questions about what medications they take. And honestly, most people don't think, I take a Claritin during cedar season. I usually don't even think about that. But that is an over-the-counter medication that has its own safety profile. Then there are miscellaneous things that can cause, um, <clears throat> that can contribute to adverse events. A reaction to a transfusion, an accidental injury. So if I was a participant on a trial, I had a small motor vehicle accident on the way home and broke my arm, that would be an adverse event. It's an unfavorable medical condition that occurred while I was participating in clinical research. Now you can logically say that had nothing to do with um, whether the, the study drug, it might have just been a bad driver or the roads were very slick, but we're going to say that's an adverse event. All right, so then we need to talk about how do we talk about adverse events. So once we decide that a medical finding is an adverse event, how do we talk about them? We are going to use very specific language set forth in MEDRA. And MEDRA stands for the Medical Dictionary for Regulatory Activities. Um, it is developed by ICH. If you're really curious, you can go Google it and look at it. But it's a dictionary. And it creates standard terminology for our adverse events. So if I was a sponsor, and I had 30 investigators across the country, I want them to all use the same language to describe their adverse events. Because if I have the same adverse event at 30 sites, but it's described with 22 different words, it's going to be very confusing for me as the sponsor to be able to categorize things. Because eventually I want to tell the FDA what happens when someone takes this medication. It applies to all phases, excluding preclinical. So phase zero through four, we're going to use the MEDRA language. And I'll give you some examples of what MEDRA is like. Someone might say they have joint pain, right? And that would make sense to you. It's joint pain. MEDRA doesn't like joint pain. MEDRA wants you to say arthralgia. And everybody who describes joint pain at all those investigative sites would all be reported as arthralgia. Shortness of breath becomes dyspnea. Fatigue is asthenia. Muscle pain, myalgia. Sweating then becomes diaphoresis. It actually doesn't sound so disgusting when you say diaphoresis. Hives then become urticaria. So if you've already taken a medical terminology class, you can understand why you need to have medical terminology. Um, and if you haven't taken it yet, you'll understand it's going to really come in handy as you look through these MEDRA examples to allow you to be able to use the, the appropriate medical terms easily and comfortably. And this is why the clinical research coordinator curriculum here has been designed this way. So there's some MEDRA examples for you. Once we decide something is an adverse event and then we know what to call it, we have the correct term, we are now going to grade the event. And there's some real advantages to grading adverse events. So some of the pros include it helps you define the adverse event. The grading scale books are usually very helpful. And then the grading scale can help you numerically classify the severity of the adverse event, right? Because we know that 
someone might have a loss of appetite where they just don't feel like eating dinner, where someone can have a serious loss of appetite where they require uh, tube feedings. There's a huge range of that experience of loss of appetite. So this numerically helps us to, to describe how severe something is, and I'll give you an example in a minute. That some of the cons, the disadvantages, the AE grading scale just gives it a numeric rating. It doesn't talk at all about what caused the adverse event. And it can't really talk about the seriousness of the adverse event. Seriousness and severity are two different things. And in our next lecture, we're going to talk about serious adverse events. So here's an example, um, common toxicity criteria, CTC, and this is version two I have on my, and there's several versions. So the first adverse event is urticaria. And there are, there are many grading uh, toxicity criteria out there, but the CTC also has in parentheses oftentimes other words, hives, welts, or wheels. And that might help you. Now you're gonna have had medical terminology under your belt, and so you're gonna be good at this. But this is sort of a clue. Um, and this, this grading scale talks about grades one through four. The first grade for urticaria requires no medication. A good example is a bee sting. You might have a bee sting that's just really irritating and you just ignore it at that point. So that's grade one. Grade two is requiring PO, which means oral or topical treatment. So in this grade two then is if my bee sting's bad enough that I decide to take some Benadryl to get rid of the hives. Now I have a grade two event. Also, IV medication or steroids for less than 24 hours. So if it's bad enough that I show up at Texas Med Clinic or some outpatient facility and I get uh, steroids or some type of IV medication, that also makes it a grade two. Grade three then, I require IV medication or steroids for more than 24 hours. And you'll see in this example, there is no grade four. We, the, it just doesn't get any worse for urticaria than grade three. You won't die of urticaria. There can't be any worse outcome than you need IV medication or steroids for more than 24 hours. Anorexia is another event. <clears throat> and anorexia, I decided to choose this one because you can see this is much harder to define. Urticaria, we have great things like less than 24 hours, 24 hours or more than 24 hours. Anorexia, which is a loss of appetite, is a little more subjective and it's a little trickier to grade. So the first one, grade one, is loss, loss of appetites. So that, that participant comes in and tells the investigator they just don't have their appetite anymore. So the investigators say, well, do you still eat three meals a day? And if that participant says, yeah, but I just, you know, I just don't enjoy it like I used to. That's a grade one. If the person says, you know, all I can get down is breakfast and then I just don't eat lunch or dinner, I just don't feel like it, that could be grade two, which is defined as oral intake significantly decreased. Now, if the person has such a a decrease in their oral intake that they are now dehydrated and they need IV fluids that becomes grade three and then the grade four anorexia is where they require tube feeding so in terms of anorexia I do have a grade four so you can sort of see now this helps me sort of define it so when the sponsor gets reports of urticaria from 20 of their investigators and there's one grade three and the rest of them are grade one that helps sort of to determine how severe those adverse events are at different investigative sites. So now the next thing we have to do, we have to determine, yes, it is an adverse event. Here's the term we're going to give it. Here's how we're going to grade it. Now the big question is, was it related to the drug under study or not? And so there's some key factors we can use to determine did the study drug cause this adverse event? The first one is the timing of the adverse event in relationship to drug exposure. So if the adverse event was vomiting and the participant says, I vomit every morning and they take their study drug at noon every day and they don't vomit afterwards, that sequence might indicate that there's not a relationship to the study drug. Now, if they take the study drug and 45 minutes later they vomit, then we can say maybe that's it. It's starting to look like maybe the, the investigational drug caused the vomiting. Absence of the adverse event prior to exposure. So remember, 
you can have something at baseline that gets worse. Well, if that participant never had that adverse event, now you're starting to think maybe that was related to the study drug. If that participant doesn't have other comorbid conditions or medications that could cause the adverse event, you might think it's the study drug. Um, so if you cannot explain the adverse event by looking at the other medical conditions that person has or the medications they're taking, then it's starting to sound like it could be the study drug, right? If you can't pin it on somebody else, then it might be the study drug. Then we can also do a de-challenge and re-challenge. So one of the options is the de-challenge. So you say, let's take away the study drug and we will not dose them for a period of time. And we're gonna see whether that adverse event gets better. If the adverse event gets better and it goes away, now this is looking like it's the study drug. And in that case, you go ahead and you reintroduce the study drug, which is called the re-challenge. If the adverse event comes back again, then you feel really confident that it went away without the study drug and it showed up with the study drug that it's caused by the study drug. So there's some things your investigator can do to really determine what caused that adverse event. So I'm gonna give you a scenario. I said we would talk through some of these things. Mrs. N is enrolled in an asthma trial at your center. At the time of entry, she had a grade two rash on her left ankle. She reports having had the rash for about six weeks prior. She comes back on her day eight visit, so she's been on the study for eight days, and then rash is noted to have spread to her entire lower leg. Remember, it was just on her ankle, so it's now her entire lower leg and requires topical antihistamines for comfort. She says it's not a problem since the rash has behaved like this on earlier occasions. Like she has seen it like this before and she's not alarmed. Is this an adverse event? She had it before. It's worse now, but she says that she's not surprised. What do we, how do we think about this? So the first question we're gonna ask was, was the rash present at baseline? No, then it's an adverse event, right? In her case, yes, she had the rash present at baseline. So my next question is, is the rash unchanged from baseline? And if the rash is exactly the same when she comes for her day eight visit, then we don't have an adverse event. If the rash is worse, which in this case it is, right? It went from being just on her ankle to being her entire lower leg, then we have an adverse event. So we're gonna talk our way through this and use an algorithm like this to think, is this an adverse event or not? And you will get really good at this. So we have some categories of adverse events and we're gonna talk about some of them. We just mentioned the adverse events. We can also have an unanticipated adverse events which are very similar to what they sound like. Give me a second, we'll, I'll give you some more details. Serious adverse events, which is the next lecture. And then you perso, unanticipated problem involving risk to subjects or others. And don't worry about writing that down right now. I have a separate slide about you persos. So what is an unexpected adverse event? Well, it sort of sounds like it is. It's an adverse event that you were not expecting to find. So it's adverse event occurring in which the nature, severity, or frequency is not consistent with either the known or foreseeable risk of adverse events associated with the clinical trial. So if your sponsor has 10 different adverse events that other people, other sites have seen with their participants, and you see one of these things, it is an adverse event that was expected, right? Because the urticaria example, if 20 investigators have grade one urticaria at their site and they're experiencing that with their patients, and you get a grade one case of urticaria, that is expected, right? It's not unexpected. So it's different, it's, it's inconsistent with the known risks, or it is inconsistent with the expected natural progression of the participant's underlying disease disorder condition. So I worked a long time in cancer trials, and some types of cancers, um, if that patient's cancer got worse, um, 
a good example is someone with asthma. Their asthma gets worse, right? That's what you expect to see sometimes. You have to understand the natural progression of a disease to say whether it is an unexpected adverse event. So if you understand how certain types of cancer work, or you understand, you understand how asthma works, so you would understand what the normal progression of that disease is, you would be able to say whether it was unexpected or not. Also within this curriculum, we have you taking a pathophysiology class. That will really be important for you to understand disease processes as you start to look about whether an adverse event is unexpected or not. And again, this is a modified definition from 21 CFR 31232A. So now UPERSO, that long acronym that you were trying to you were trying to, to scribble down, it's an unanticipated problem involving risk to subject or others. So it's an unanticipated problem involving risk to subjects or others. It's any incident, experience, or outcome that meets all of the following criteria. So if you don't meet all of the following criteria, it's not a you perso. Unexpected, related to participation in the research, and this is the important part because otherwise we would just have an unexpected adverse event. It places the subject or subjects at a greater risk of physical, psychological, or social harm than was previously known or recognized. This is very uncommon. I'll be honest with you, you persos are rare. I want to make you aware of them though because um, these are important things to report and they're very uncommon as I said. So here's an example. An investigator conducting behavioral research collects individually identifiable sensitive information about illicit drug use and other illegal behaviors by surveying college students. The data is stored on a laptop computer without encryption. Goodness knows why this, this guy is doing this, but anyway, without encryption, and the laptop is stolen from the investigator's car on the way home from work. He stops at HEB, and lo and behold, he comes out, and his car has been cleaned, and the computer with all of that really sensitive information is gone. How would you classify this event? Okay, first question, was the event unexpected? No. Then it's not a you person. But yes, no one expects to have their car cleaned out. So yes, it was unexpected. So now we have to say, was the event related to research? No, it's not a you perso. But I'm saying yes, the stuff that happened in there was related. So all the data was related to research, and the sub put the sub with the subjects at greater risk of physical, psychological, or social harm. No, it's not a you perso. Yes, this is a you perso. Um, and again, these are, I said that they're unusual, and you can sort of see why I say that. Though that's not an everyday occurrence that you're going to run into. But this is a sort of a larger way to look at data. And it's usually involving data breaches and things like that. So yes, the fact that there was all that illegal behavior data unencrypted on his laptop puts those students at greater risk of psychological or social harm, not physical. But they, they have some, they, there's some risk there for those students. Another scenario, a uh, result of a processing error by a pharmacy technician, a subject rolled in a multi-center clinical trial receives a dose of an experimental drug that is 10 times higher than the dose dictated by the IRB approved protocol. While the dosing area error, excuse me, increased the risk of toxicity, the subject experienced no detectable harm or adverse effect after an appropriate period of careful observation. How would you classify this event? So an error happened, it was a deviation from the protocol, but everyone is very relieved that nothing happened to this person. They had no detectable harm that occurred. How would you classify this event? So again, this is another you perso. It was unexpected, no one ever planned. It was an error, so it was unexpected. It happened because the person was on a protocol and it involved risk, potential risk. Now, we lucked out. This person was okay, but that was just an awful lot of luck. Here are the references. If you want to go, you're going to go back, not if you want to. You will go back if you haven't already read the Adverse Events and Safety Monitoring in our textbook. And you know I love your questions, so please let me know if you have any, if anything needs clarified. It was a lot of information to consider. Next uh, lecture up is serious adverse events.
Talk to you soon. Take care.